really 20 years before anybody else. And he created some kind of a machine which was like amazing machine. Yes, it was something that if you placed it in this room would start at the door in the back and come up here, out here, creating these first ever 3D prints. And in an order, just as a interesting story, he wanted to prove to potential buyers how superior the technology would be, and he came up with the following marketing idea. He said, I can manufacture something through my system that you cannot manufacture in any other process. Yeah, to which the, the answer system. was, why would I want something that I can't manufacture at the end <laughs> of the day? And, and we haven't solved the problem since. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the IP was sold uh, to another company. I think and, that Cytex, us using Cytex as a model, because the two of us know the company pretty well, uh, you see that uh, one company can, can spin off many, many ideas, some of them good, some of them, uh, some of them not, so, uh, not so successful. Uh, by the way, we mentioned Effie Arazi. Uh, we will go for history because you can learn from history a little bit. His brother pioneered another industry. Danny. What, what did Danny pioneer? No, not in Orkid. No. Yeah, he, he was the first one to use video for education. Can you talk Absolutely. about it? Uh, uh, the, for those of you who are old enough to remember video discs, at the time, uh, he started the first company to try to use them for uh, the video disc technology for training purposes, training of service engineers. Which everybody engineers. talks about it today, you know, Coursera, etc. Yeah, and to today, it's, it's obvious. The technology was very crude and expensive at the time. Creation of content was very hard. I was his first customer because my boss was his brother. You can imagine <laughs> how that came about. So I was a benefit. Every, everything in Israel is inc incestuous, yeah. you call in, it? In, yeah, incestuous indeed. And uh, the technology since has come a really long way, a really long way. And at last, we're now where te educational technology, I think, is beginning to make some real impact. So what, uh, Yoav, what is worse, to be too early or too late? Uh, too early, too if early you give me a choice, worse. Yes. Yeah, the, the, way, uh, the way people look at it, when you're too early to market, by the time the market wakes up, you've spent too much money, you may have gone through two financing rounds, you've diluted the entrepreneurs, and somebody is coming in with a version 2 or version 3, and you still have to redo that. Uh, you know how the Americans are saying. No, how do they say that? They say that the, the early bird gets the, the worm. worm. Right. So if you are warm, you should rise late. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. Right? Absolutely. And there is Same another bit. saying, which is manifesting this idea that being too early is not always good. The second mouse gets the cheese. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> All right. So I was dead on. Thanks. Okay. I'll try to remember that. So this is true second also. Second mouse gets the cheese. You like it? I, I do. I do. What you prefer to be the first mouse or the second mouse, if you can have the choice? Who thinks being the first mouse is better? Raise your hand. Who thinks being the second mouse is the better? Raise your hand. So let's make it this link. Like okay. we have about 150 people in the crowd. One thinks that being the second mouse is, is, better. is better. Three think that being the first mouse is the better. Three to one. So what happened with the other 146 you think? They are mentally elsewhere. <laughs> they are either sleeping, or they don't understand our accent. That's a possibility. Or what we say going totally over their head. <laughs> Pardon? So, so, so that, that's a great question. Who believes that it's better to be the first mover in a new industry? They really sleep. Okay. I think we are not performing so. Who thinks that what we are talking make any sense? Thank you. <laughs> who think who think that this panel? But be honest. Who think that this panel is awful? Raise your hand. <laughs> Only two. Okay, there are at least. Uh, They've paid for admission, right? Okay. Who think this panel is wonderful? Raise your hand. <laughs> we are not doing so bad, you know. Quit, quit while we're ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Oli, will you invite us next year also? Okay. Now, I would like to, to ask the, 
But if, if I can, just to, on this point again. No, you cannot. I cannot. No, you can. You can. Go ahead. The problem in today's technology is as technology becomes more and more sort of like internet stuff and, and software based and so on, there's a real problem that did not exist until several years ago. And here it is. The problem in, in software based industries in the new industry is very simple. Winner take all. There's no number two. There is no number two. So in the old days, if you used to make cabinets or chairs or tables or fax machines or hi-fi stereos or what have you, you know, there were five, six, seven participants. That doesn't exist anymore. There doesn't exist anymore. How many people dominate the... Look how many years it took to get to a second operating system in the world. 20 years during which there was only one. How many Amazons are out there of any substantial? So the real problem, regardless of whether you're first or you're second, the real problem is that in today's market, success is everything, and there is no number two. So the second, but still the second mice, mouse got the cheese. Which is the big paradox. So we all like safety, but at the end of the day, if the first okay. one got it right, it's going to be very hard to be the second one. Okay, anybody in the audience have a good explanation why Israel is so successful in the high tech? Come on, hey. The Jewish, the Jewish mother. Who is the idiot who said it? <laughs> who is your mother? This was my son, Danny. Okay, the Jewish mother. Do we want to talk about the Jewish mother? You're the boss. I'm the boss. Okay, let's talk about the Jewish mother. What is the role of the Jewish mother in, uh, in the success of the Israeli high tech? Uh, to raise expectations to a level that you can never meet. No, no. Yeah, to challenge, to challenge, to challenge a sibling to go and try to achieve and accomplish, etc. Right? Yeah, you know, there was a survey that most entrepreneurs are not the eldest son in the family. It's usually number two or number three. And the way it works is along the line, if you're number three, you keep hearing, why aren't you as good as your older brother, right? So after 15 years, 20 years of getting that, you figure you might have to, to find a way to solve the problem. No, I can tell you, my mother, honest to God, always told me why all my sisters have uh, sons and daughters who are geniuses and only me, my mother, I have a son who is an idiot, as I told many times. But she also provided, uh, provided a good explanation, you know. She, in spite of the fact that she may, I think, may had only eight years of education, she had a natural understanding of genetics. And she said, your cousins are smart and you are an idiot because they are not contaminated with the genes of your father. <laughs> but you have, you, have to, you have to understand you have to understand a little bit of Jewish ge geography. She was from Belarus, which is closer to Russia than Poland. My father came from Poland, and she was from Belarus. So we always snubbed him a little bit, you know, a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. She also had a very deep understanding in, uh, in modern physics. When she married my father, she was one year older than him. And when she died, she was five, year, five years younger than him. So I told, I told the mom, it, it doesn't work this in linear mathematics, you know. If you were one year older than him, when you died, you also were one year older. Maybe in percentage, it was little, uh, less. So, he, no, no, she told me, no, no, this is because of Einstein. This is because of Einstein. So I asked her, what Einstein has to do with it. She told me, you know, your father used to walk slowly and I used to move very fast and bodies which are moving fast have a shortage, sh shorter time, you know, so, so she had an understanding in, uh, and also if we talk about my mother, Danny, I'm sorry you heard all these jokes already 100 times. She was, this is not known, she was one of the pioneers of biotechnology in this country, you didn't know that. Because at the time of the austerity, she had a small restaurant in Schenken Street. My father went to Independence Day and she, in order to support the family, opened a restaurant in Schenken Street. But this was 1949 and 1950, there was nothing here. It was the austerity. When, when were you born? 
53, so you don't remember it. So she was very creative. She was able to turn any organic substance to chopped liver, you know, so... <laughs> including feathers and newspaper stuff, etc. I don't want to, to, to offend anybody, you know, but uh, I was in a ceremony in the uh, in, uh, United States and the uh, reverend told about this miracle that Jesus went to the, to the wedding of the, of the widower in the village of Cana and she married his son and uh, she married her son, I'm sorry, and she didn't have wine to serve to the, to the guests so he turned the water into wine. And this is a very big and respected miracle. I said, with all due respect, you know, my mother made much bigger miracles, you know, because... <laughs> yeah, okay. then I thought if she would be living that time, you know, what could be... Uh, the whole history could be changed. You know, if, if, if we're contemplating different forms of entrepreneurship and technology innovations, like converting things to chopped liver, then just another historic story. My ancestor that I was telling you that built up Neve Tzedek used to be a goldsmith. So he would create a... He used to be what? A goldsmith. So he dealt in, in, in jewelry and in currency. At the time, the people who ruled this country were the Turks, the Ottomans. So there was a coin called the Bishlik, and he discovered, he was, I don't know why he was the first one to discover this, he discovered that there was silver, the, the metal silver, in, the, in that specific coin, and the value of the raw material, silver, was higher than the value of the coin which creates a wonderful opportunity if you think about that. So he started buying up coins and smelting mm. them into ingots of silver and he got financing, there was VCs at the time actually, he got financing from Montague Bank, I checked it in London. They would finance his acquisitions here and he started buying coins on the market, turning them into um, silver and shipping it to London. And the deal was going pretty well until it took him about a month there was no more currency in the whole of Jaffa. You couldn't buy anything. <laughs> so he single-handedly created inflation. <laughs> and all the money was shipped elsewhere. And by the time people discovered it, uh, he was already into real estate. So he had his own exit and uh, things moved on. So yeah, people You know, I heard, I heard that the tax collector came to his grand-grandfather and, and, asked him, and asked him for where did you have... Uh, money to buy this uh, villa, you know, this wonderful house. So he said, uh, I was sleeping and in my sleep, my grand-grandfather came and told me, my grandson, there is a ton of bishliks under the fig tree in the yard. So he, he said he woke up at two o'clock in the morning and he dug the ground and he found the bishlik and from that he built this huge villa. So the tax collector asked him, this is a terrific story, but do you have any proofs? He said, sure I have a proof. They asked him, what is the proof? He said, the villa. <laughs> Good. Let me add again from my recycled Jewish mother, think few additional things about the Jewish mother. One of the ways of the, the, the Jewish mother to motivate her son is by embedding in him guilt feelings, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know the story about the Jewish mother who told her son, I was sitting all Saturday long and uh, the telephone didn't ring and I know it was you. <laughs> He's a good crowd. He's sounds, laughing. Sounds, sounds like my mother. Yeah. <laughs> I am not happy. I'm not, not happy. Not but also sounds like uh, my wife is a VR kid, so it uh, moves on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and uh, before we... First of all, I'm not happy with your laughter. Can you try better? Can you try to give a better laughter? Okay, now we should Great. move also to the importance of the mother-in-law in driving. <laughs> Can you share with us some of your experience? Jennifer Schenker, are, are you here? Jennifer? She's not here, okay. I don't know, one, one of the things I learned, I spent a lot of time in my early career in Japan. 
And I learned very, very swiftly that apparently mothers-in-law in the East or in Japan or in China and Taiwan are revered and you have to work very hard for them and your wife is practically a slave serving the elder generation. Whereas here the mother-in-law is more something to be dreaded and, and, and feared. So that gives rise to a ton of jokes about the mother-in-law and I try to share some of them with my Japanese colleagues. Uh, literally, they know that humor doesn't transfer very well across uh, Especially nations. to Japanese. Absolutely. That's they a say big the problem. Thing, they say the same thing about us. So, two lessons, at least the, the, the lesson I had is don't try to export humor. It doesn't necessarily work. But I'll tell you one, uh, one true story which happened. I interviewed uh, Joe Lieberman. You know, Joe Lieberman was the first, the first uh, Jewish person who was nominated to run for vice president in the United States. So I interviewed in some conference and I told him, Joe, before we go to the topics, can you tell us for once, is when you were, when, we, when you did, when you were nominated to be the vice president of United States, did your mother-in-law at last approved you, accepted you? He look at me and he says, accepted me, approved me. The first call I got when it was announced that I'm nominated to vice president of the United States, which is a big honor, was from my mother-in-law. And she says, Joe, a temporary job again? 